If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. This is the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. From St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Jason Rosenbaum. Later in the hour, we'll discuss highlights of Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker's State of the State and Budget Address and get reaction from a Republican state senator. But first, St. Louis is in an unusual position of having a lot of extra money, primarily from a settlement from the departure of the St. Louis Rams. City leaders also got some more positive news last year with a drop in violent crime and a nearly 21 percent decline in homicides. Even with the good news, St. Louis policymakers still have a lot of work to do to fully address some long-standing problems. That includes caring for a large homeless population, making streets safer for pedestrians, and dealing with tensions between police and marginalized communities. Joining us in studio today is the person who gets the lion's share of the credit or blame for the city's trajectory. St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones. Madam Mayor, welcome to the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, Last year, there were 158 homicides compared to 200 in 2022. What are some of the factors that led to the 2023 drop in violent crime and homicides? Well, I would say it's a few things, and it's several things all working at once. So we started the Office of Violence Prevention in 2022 and hired Will Pinckney as its director. Will's primary responsibility is to work with grassroots organizations on the ground on violence and eruption, find out what the communities need, um, and deploy resources in those in, in, in those neighborhoods. So we have uh, the Cops and Clinicians program that ha- that pairs a behavioral health professional with an officer. Uh, we just launched back in November a non-police response, uh, which is just behavioral health um, professionals, uh, as well as our uh, our investment in youth and young people because our gun incidents with young people is down 50 percent. And we got a new police chief uh, who believes in data and following the data. Um, And uh, he's been here for a year. So it's a whole host of things working in tandem and working with community that led to that uh, precipitous decrease. The union that represents most St. Louis police officers as of a month ago reported there are still around 326 officer vacancies. And we have just talked about the drop in crime rates. To what extent do you think that these vacancies are a big deal toward continuing that momentum? Well, absolutely. We could we could use more officers. We can use more uh, other employees. Uh, we have a total of about 1,700 vacancies uh, in the city total. Uh, but talk to any mayor across the country and they'll tell you the same thing, that they have uh, the largest number of vacancies in police officers that they've seen um, probably in decades, as well as a, uh, an open open positions uh, in city government. So we're all struggling. Well, I think one of the reasons why St. Louis is unique is just the way the, the region is spread out. Not only do you mm-hmm. have St. Louis County Police right next to you, which probably pays more depending on your experience, but you also have municipal police departments. Let's just say the O'Fallon Police Department in St. Charles, right. which may pay better and it's just frankly a different job than patrolling the north or south side of St. Louis. Is that just a, a type of job tension that is just never going to go away and the city is never going to be able to be competitive to some of those other places? Well, we are somewhat competitive. Uh, j- also last year, we increased pay um, for the first time in 20 years. Um, uh, that is the largest increase in 20 years uh, for our officers for their starting salaries and also for their uh, for their steps up. Um, and what we saw was 14 officers come back to the force from those other municipalities. Um, and we also uh, are taking a different approach to our uh, academy classes. We're doing them on a rolling basis rather than just to wait until the academy class is full and then do the class. Uh, And so we saw four academy classes graduate also in 2023. Um, So we're we're doing everything that we can to uh, address uh, recruitment and retention um, uh, that's physically possible within within our reach. 
So we've received a lot of questions from listeners, particularly about public safety, including one from Reddit from Goal Mom 500. Why is the police department driving so badly? Why are there no oversight of multiple accidents that they take no responsibility for? How many auto accidents are too many? And this is a reference to several high-profile incidents, including when a police car crashed into Bar PM in South St. Louis and a police mm-hmm. cruiser hit a church sign and, mm-hmm. and then apparently tried to cover it up. What is going on with the way some police officers are driving in the city of St. Louis? Because this has caused a lot of concern and attention. Well, um, I let me start with I, I feel for those who who have been impacted by any accident uh, that has uh, happened with our, our officers. Uh, but the second part is our cars have changed. We used to drive Impalas. Now we drive Tahoes. And those are pretty difficult to steer um, in difficult situations. So um, uh, could police actually benefit from, or or I would say our new police benefit from more hours um, with Tahoes to get used to how they operate, how they how they move, how they turn? Absolutely. Um, but we also have to realize these are different and larger vehicles that we're that we're driving nowadays versus back in the past. I was watching an interview with Police Chief Tracy in KSDK, and he said to the reporter that, and I'm paraphrasing mm-hmm. here. There wouldn't have been as big of an outcry for a toxicology request for the officers in the car that slammed into Bar PM if it wasn't a bar that's well known in the LGBTQ community. You saw those comments. What what do you make of them? Well, I I think what happened is... uh there's already a fractured relationship between police officers and the LGBTQ plus community. And unfortunately, that accident just exacerbated or tore a Band-Aid off of an open wound that hadn't healed correctly in the first place. Uh, so we have taken uh, the necessary steps to help our PM, um, our our um, uh, building division director, Frank Oswald, has been down to meet with them uh, to to offer architectural services as as they rebuild and repair uh, the damage done by the vehicle. So um, we are taking the necessary steps to make them whole. But do you think that the do you agree with what the police chief said there? Like, I think a lot of people were kind of taken aback because, I mean, let me just put it this way. If a Richmond Heights police officer crashed into my house the first thing that would go into my mind, too, is was that officer under the influence? I don't think it really matters if it's an LGBTQ bar situation. Mm-hmm. I think it's just a startling situation that you want to know why did this happen, basically. Well, I mean, we we had a conversation with the officer and he felt uh, horrible about um, about what happened. And uh, and he admitted that he was distracted while driving. Uh, that happens to the best of us. None of us have perfect driving records. Myself included. I want to point that out. <laughs> uh, Reddit user Def Indif. One of my favorite parts of the show is just reading the Reddit usernames, the by user the way. Names, right. The usernames are, are great. Is the mayor concerned that Chief Tracy is receiving a significant amount of money from an interest group that may influence policing decisions? And that references the fact that Chief Tracy receives $100,000 a year from the Police Foundation, which is funded, I think, with from the region's business mm-hmm. community. Mm-hmm. Jeremy Kohler, ProPublica, highlighted this arrangement earlier this month and, and found it's somewhat unusual in the law enforcement space. This is not a secret. Right. Your, your office actually pointed this out in a press release. Right. But do you feel confident that there is no undue influence on the chief with I, this arrangement? And if I, so, why? I absolutely do. Because if you read the contract, um, which has also been out in the public, is that the police foundation is asking him to be present at community meetings and do an annual community report. That's, But that's already in Chief Tracy's blood. That's what he does. Um and so, no, I am not concerned. Um, but I will say this: our our salary cap at the city capped stopped at one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. And I wanted to attract um, one of the best police chiefs in the country. Um, and we had to raise the salary some way. Uh, and remember, we have parity. So anytime you raise the police officer salaries, you have to raise firefighter salaries. And so the raise that we made with the police chief to get to 175, we also had to do that with the fire chief. So this could be very, this could get very, very expensive. Um, but the average police chief salary around the country for a city our size is in the 200s. And if we want to attract talent, 
um, then we have to uh, we have to find innovative ways in order to do so. Um, I want to talk about uh, automated traffic devices, which mm-hmm. is you know red light cameras are in that, but it's right. not just red it's light not, cameras. Right. Exactly. Um, a 2017 Missouri Supreme Court ruling ruled them unconstitutional in the way they were being done at the time. But right. they, but basically, you can set them up. In, in a in a way where like the camera shows the driver driving the car right and I I think you support bringing them back is first of all is that true and if so why do you think it's important to bring them back I, I think it's important to bring uh, automated camera enforcement back uh, particularly because we do have an officer shortage um, we want to make sure that we are supplementing um, our enforcement with uh, with technology, um, and we've done that with just regular cameras. That's how we've been able to, and license plate readers, that's how we've been able to solve some crimes and track some people down. Um, but I think what's going to be different this time is uh, people didn't feel like they had due process. And so we will try, we are making sure that people have due process to prove that, you know, no, that was not me driving the car, obviously, because you can see the person's face and not the, the back of their head like the previous cameras were. Um, but also, uh, the, we're not trying to make a whole boatload of money off of this either. Uh, the money that we do bring in uh, after we pay for municipal court fees is going to go into a traffic safety fund that's going to fund more of our traffic safety measures across the city. Do you know how it's functionally going to work and whether people can get around it by like wearing a hat or wearing sunglasses or wearing a mask or something like that? Or is that just so granular right now before you actually pass? to implement that. Right. First, we have to pass the bill, and then we have to issue an RFP, and they will see what kind of technology is out there um, from the different vendors. Uh, and I'm sure that they have dealt with uh, with this in other cities. We posted a video last year about the possible return of red light cameras. And, and to say that the response was, frankly, overwhelming would be an understatement. In addition to getting like 52,000 views on Instagram, there were nearly 266 comments, some which admittingly wanted red light cameras back. But a lot of them as I'm sure that you're not surprised, we're, we're pretty negative on the idea. For example, Cheryl Frank said, I am for anything that makes the street safer, but for Pete's sakes, where is the police presence in the city? My husband and I have lived here for eight years and rarely see any police unless they were hired as a third party for an event. Now, I'm sure that that experience is not universal. I'm sure people have seen police all the time. Mm-hmm. But what would you make, not only of that concern, but maybe of broader concerns that you're using a private entity, which is, you know, a red light camera company to do what should be a public function, which is policing traffic. Well, uh, we do have our police policing traffic. Um, Our ticket writing is back up to pre-pandemic levels. Um, And obviously we slowed down during the pandemic because of the interaction between uh, police, you know, we didn't want them to get sick. We did have an officer actually almost die from COVID from a traffic stop, you know, because he caught COVID that way. Um, so our, we, but we are using the data to uh, to determine where we are deploying our, uh, our traffic enforcement officers. We need to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with St. Louis Mayor Tashara Jones. This is the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. The Gateway brings you the day's news each weekday from around the St. Louis region and the state capitals in Jefferson City. Our schools are accredited. We don't need this bill. And Springfield. How many more years must pass before lawmakers see time is of the essence? I'm Abby Larico. Join me each weekday for The Gateway on the STLPR app or wherever you get podcasts. Welcome back to the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. We now return to our conversation with Tashara Jones, the mayor of St. Louis. Um, One of the areas where there seems to be maybe some differences of opinion between you and the Board of Aldermen is now scuttled legislation that would have addressed the city's policies toward homelessness. And there are a lot of things in these bills, including the creation of intentional encampments, restrictions on breaking up encampments, and very major changes to how shelters would be approved. So when I was talking with your spokesperson before these bills got shelved, 
he mentioned to me that you had a lot of misgivings about these bills. So I, I want to ask you directly, rather than going through a spokesperson, mm-hmm. what was kind of your, I guess, heartburn over these proposals? Well, uh, I would prefer to uh, address uh, homelessness uh, by its root causes. Um, and that means making sure that we are providing uh, as much um, uh Uh, temporary and transitional housing as possible. Uh, If you have seen the Jefferson Spaces um, that's on um, Cass and Jefferson, or Martin Luther King and Jefferson, I'm sorry, uh, there, we expanded that village from 50 to 100 homes. And the average length of stay for an unhoused neighbor that uh, interacts with uh, our Jefferson Spaces, which uh, receives also wraparound services, is about four to six months. Um, the uh, vendor that's there, the Magdala Foundation, does wonderful work uh, trying to make um, our neighbors whole again. So that's getting them their ID, getting them access to medicine, Medicaid if they qualify, finding permanent housing for them through the housing authority or other other partners that help um, that help with uh, permanent and supportive housing. So I would rather uh, tackle it that way. And then also we shoulder the burden of caring for our unhoused uh, for the entire region. And that's not sustainable. That's actually my you, you read my mind. <laughs> You're good. You're good, mind reader, yeah. Madam Mayor. Uh, what sort of discussions have you had with St. Louis County Executive Sam Page about the county actually providing either money or actual places where homeless people can go, so that you are not having to deal with the problem yourself? Because I live in St. Louis County. Yes. There are homeless people in St. Louis County. Yes. There's a lot. Yes. But it seems like it's always the city's responsibility to come up with the policy. Exactly. And it's always the city's responsibility to come up with all of the shelters and the city's responsibility to come up with all of the everything, right? Uh, fill in the blank. And so um, I became chair of East West Gateway Council of Governments um, for your listeners' uh, edification. That is uh, all of the county executives from O'Fallon, Missouri to O'Fallon, Illinois. Um, and we meet monthly. And last year, I called on them to do a regional crime summit to talk about crime as a regional issue, because uh, crime doesn't stop at our borders, especially not St. Louis's borders. And so we're moving forward on a crime strategy there. Next, I'm going to call for a a serious conversation about how we can all pull together to help our unhoused, because it is a regional issue. What we find when we um, uh, uh, do our point in time count of where people come from over 50 percent or more come from outside of the city and i'm not saying that we don't want to take care of them but it's not sustainable for the city to shoulder the the burden for the entire region well let me just throw out a potential idea is it possible to maybe partner with say a bordering st louis county municipality and then have the city the county and that municipality help pay collectively for shelter space within the county's borders because the big reason that I've always been told why St. Louis County doesn't operate their own shelters in St. Louis County is they would have to build an unincorporated St. Louis County. So that's either South County or it's North St. Louis County. And frankly, both of those places are going to, there's going to be public opposition to that, whereas there may be less public opposition in places like Maplewood, Richmond Heights, Brentwood. What about that particular idea? Well, where we found that there's not a lot of public opposition is tiny home villages. Mm -hmm. Um, We built a new tiny home village with the uh, help of the Veterans Community Project just on North Grand. And if anybody hasn't seen it, they are beautiful uh, little homes uh, for our veterans. And they provide wraparound services to help our veterans get back on their feet. Same thing with Jefferson Spaces. if, If I had a magic wand, I would have tiny home villages around the region with um, uh, wraparound services because we do have enough vendors and enough uh, social service agencies um, and organiza- nonprofit organizations that can help take care of our unhoused no matter where they fall into vulnerable positions. I do want to go back to the legislation, which I think is going to be talked about over the next few months. Like right now, if somebody wants to open up a shelter in the city, they have to get signatures of 51% of the people that live within 500 feet. Mm -hmm. Doesn't this unquestionably make it much more difficult to open shelters? And is that an idea worth exploring about changing that process? Well, it absolutely is. Um, We are um, uh, 
we uh, St. Louis has a platinum petition process for a couple of other uh, things as well. Uh, we are tomorrow. The Board of Aldermen is debating the excise bill or changes to excise because it you, it requires a platinum petition process for 350 feet if you're going to open a restaurant. And would the same process apply for tiny tiny homes too? Um, I don't know. I'm I'm not sure if it does, but but, um, Jefferson Spaces has been there for, you know, before my administration and I just expanded it. Well, I want to move on to some money matters. And maybe this is more exciting than talking about the problems that have plagued the city for decades. Um, Let's talk about MetroLink expansion first, Um, particularly building a line that goes north and south. Mm -hmm. How realistic is it for the city to pursue that project? And what discussions have you had with the federal government about getting a match? So um, I I would say it is realistic. We have been saving, uh, putting money in our savings account uh, through um, uh, prop uh, I want to say Prop S. Yes. In fact, I actually asked Paul mm-hmm. Payne about that. There's 81. There will be $81 million available by the end of the fiscal year. Right. But continue. And our portion uh, for this particular project, which is $1.1 billion, is $90 million. Um, so we have been in conversation with the Department of Transportation, with the FTA. Um, uh, I've been in direct conversation with Secretary Buttigieg um, about this project. And um, I, I do believe that it is uh, it's doable. Um, and, uh, you know, been, I've been working with uh, By State and Talby Roach. Uh, we've been in several presentations together to the Department of Transportation. And the one thing that um, they enjoyed about our presentation was a couple of things, but number one was that there's planned development along the route. uh, So that uh, deals with ridership questions. Uh, Number two, that uh, Talby and I are coming together for this project, uh, that they don't have to wonder if the uh, transit authority doesn't agree with the mayor's office. Um, And number three, it meets uh, the Justice 40 uh, conditions, the economic uh, uh, justice 40 um, executive order that President Biden signed shortly after he got into office uh, that gives more points to projects that address neighborhoods that are marginalized or disinvested. So I've seen some rumblings from what I would classify as mass transit enthusiasts who have said that they would prefer bus rapid transit over light rail expansion. For our listeners, that it's more or less dedicated bus lanes And you've seen that in Mm -hmm. other cities. What do you think of that idea? Well, I want to keep my promise to the people in North St. Louis. We started collecting money in this tax and told them that we would build them a Metrolink and um, and to build them bus rapid transit would not be keeping their keeping our promise to them. We've also received a lot of questions about the Ram settlement, including this one from Reddit user Queequeg789. Now that we've voted on how to spend the NFL money, when can we expect detailed proposals and actionable plans? There's been some of the vote, some of the proposals include fixing the city's water mains, providing raises for city employees, subsidized child care for residents. Uh, Do you have any preferences on how the Rams funds should be spent in the near and long term? So I I think people should uh, recognize that a a couple of things. Number one, that we still have ARPA money to spend that that has a date certain of when we have to spend it, which is December 31st, 2026. And we have to have it obligated by the end of this year. So we are laser focused on making sure that we spend every dollar of the money that we receive from the American Rescue Plan. And some of that could be spent on water main related things. There's not enough money between what we have in ARPA and the Rams money to be to spend to spend on what needs what the water department needs fair fair enough but (laughs) um but the other piece um of that is uh if if i had a magic wand i would set aside a bulk of it for a municipal endowment fund and we would live off the interest for many many years to come it is my um as i you know i have i have i majored in finance um, when I was in college and worked in investment banking. And so as a former banker, I am trying to see how we can uh, keep a, a good chunk of it uh, to make sure that we are prepared financially for anything to come down the road. This is one-time money, so you have to be careful about how you spend one-time money. Because, I, I, okay, I know that city employees need more money. We've talked on the Politically Speaking podcast about corrections employees. But it doesn't seem to me that using the Rams money for ongoing things like salaries or daycare 
is going to be sustainable. It's not. It's not smart and it's not sustainable. And city employees have received a 9 percent increase under my under under my mayorship. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not trying yeah. to say you haven't, but mm-hmm. I am trying to say that there's still probably people that want more of a raise because of inflation, like, you know, everybody right now. Right. But right. I actually want to play this clip that St. Louis on the Air producer Maya Norfleet received from Kelly McGowan, who runs the nonprofit Transform 314. It has been documented that Black residents are the largest group leaving the city, with 63 Black families leaving the city every month since, I believe, 2019. Why do you think this is happening? And how is your administration working to address this issue? Yeah, so I um, I know several black families that have left St. Louis, and they leave it for a myriad of reasons, uh, for opportunity. They leave it uh, for educational opportunities for their children. Um, you know, there are there and and uh, and let's 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 just be frank. St. Louis isn't always the most welcoming city for people of color. Um, so uh, what am I doing? We are having those conversations with some of the families who've left and asking them why. Uh, we're doing focus groups with the people who have decided to stay, asking them um, what should we do differently as a region, as a as an administration to help you to help you stay. Um, and uh, we take this seriously. You know, uh, if you look between the t- 2010 and 2020 census, tens of thousands of black families have left. Um, and so we need to provide better opportunities for people to stay. Um, we need to build more housing um, and affordable and safe housing. Um, and we need to uh, make sure that we're making a market investment um, in, in, uh, in opportunity for people to stay. I, I think you mentioned schools. I mean, very candidly, you know this. I left mm-hmm. St. Louis City mm-hmm because of the schools, because my son has developmental disabilities and the special education system is better in the county than the city. And anybody would tell you that. But I feel like that is probably a big reason why, not special education, but just the schools in general. I understand you don't have control over the schools, but you do have a bully pulpit. Is there anything that you want to do with your administration to help St. Louis public schools? Well, I started as treasurer when I started the College Kids Children's Savings Account Program uh, to provide uh, educational savings accounts for children in public schools, uh, whether that was district or charter. Um, You know, again, as you said in your question, I'm not responsible for the schools, but I am responsible for the environment that our children come from so they can show up ready to learn every day. So what can I do? I can uh, clean up neighborhoods and build new housing. Um, I can make sure there's less vacancy. I can make Make sure uh, that parents have access to good uh, working uh, working wage jobs so they can take care of their family. Um, we can make sure that our streets are safe and, and, and we can uh, put an emphasis on public safety. We can also make sure that our youth and young people have things to do um, when their parents are at work or, or on the weekends and, and lots of activities for them to be safe and, and have fun and just be a kid. So before we go, I want to talk with you about uh, your plan to veto legislation that would change how the firefighters pension is overseen. Um, Why are you planning to do that? And what are kind of your thoughts about whether this veto could be sustained or overridden at this point in time? Um, So this particular bill would overhaul the changes made to the firefighters pension in 2012. And those changes were made to save money uh, for the city uh, to reverse the significant cost increases that came with the old retirement system. Uh, If this bill um, uh, stands, it could cost up to 16, it could, it could blow a hole in our budget up, up to $16 million. Um, and we're trying to make sure that we can give our employees raises or continue to give our employees raises to continue to provide services. But if you have a $16 million hole that's blown in your budget, uh, that that takes away basically the parks, the streets, and the forestry departments. And how would it cost that much? From reading the bill, I think it would allow the board that oversees like the old pension to oversee the new pension. Is it just the fear that they're going to recommend more generous benefits and the board of aldermen is going to approve them just because the firefighters are politically a very potent 
force, basically. Well, not only that, it also goes back to state control of the firefighters' pension. Um, there are There's language in there that, that this would be a state takeover of our firefighters' pension plan. Nobody wants that because we know what the state uh, is, is capable and incapable of doing. Um, you know, this is, uh, again, this is this has increased the cost to a point where we can't have conversations with our unions or with our budget director about raises until this is resolved. The other piece that we need to think about is that uh, the legislature is coming after the earnings tax. So we shouldn't be passing bills to increase our costs to pension systems while we are in danger of, uh, of eliminating the earnings tax. And we still have pending litigation uh, for the remote worker part of the earnings tax. Tashara Jones is the mayor of the city of St. Louis. Madam Mayor, thank you so much for joining us thank today. Thank you for having me. Now we turn our attention to Illinois, where Governor J.B. Pritzker delivered his State of the State and Budgetary Address this week. And in a few moments, we'll hear from a Republican state senator about her reaction. But first, St. Louis Public Radio Metro East reporter Will Bauer is in the studio to discuss the chief executive's 2024 priorities. Will, welcome. Thanks, Jason. Pritzker talked extensively about how he's putting forth a balanced budget while also proposing expansions to things like early childhood education programs. How is he able to pull this off? Well, two big things here, and he's proposing that the legislature extend uh, a cap that limits how much money corporations can write off as losses. Right now, that's $100,000. He wants that to be $500,000. And the second part to that is he's proposing more than doubling taxes that sports books or the, the area part of a casino where you'd place your bet on sports gambling on how much money those sports books um, or how much doubling the taxes on the profits of sports um from sports books. And so he's doing that because government forecasters had projected that Illinois would be in a uh, deficit next fiscal year that runs from July 2024 to June 2025. So they would nearly uh, they would be nearly $900,000 in the hole. So these two changes to the tax system would make up for a majority of that and then would allow them to make those educational investments. Was there anything in Pritzker's address that wasn't well received even by people in his own party? I would say that there were, of course, some things that Republicans are fairly resistant to. Of course, those two tax changes, um, Republicans are going to generally be pretty resistant to that. Um, Republicans have also been fairly critical of Governor Pritzker and the Democrats' plans to address the migrant crisis that's happening in Chicago right now. He has pitched that the legislature send another $182 million from the state budget to help solve that ongoing situation. Um, along the same lines, he's also um, pitched that the state continue giving health care to undocumented migrants over the age of 42 that would otherwise qualify for Medicaid. And those two are pretty unpopular with the GOP. But the, the elephant in the room, pun intended, I suppose, is that Democrats have huge majorities in the House and Senate and Republicans don't really have leverage to stop any of the governor's major priorities. So. Should he expect to encounter any legislative resistance to anything he said in his speech? Probably not. From the 10,000-foot view, the Democrats in the Illinois General Assembly appear to get along. And as long as they do, Republicans make can make their demands, but the Democrats don't need a single vote to do anything. It's not like in Missouri where there's like a conservative caucus rump group in, in Illinois. So yes. that seems to be a big difference between the two states. Yes, they're almost opposites. But one of the other things I noticed, Pritzker seemed to contrast Illinois with other states, including California, which is undergoing a a budgetary crisis. Why do you think he did that? Well, if you've been noticing, uh, Governor Pritzker has kind of been pitching himself on a national political level. Um, And because of his wealth, some pundits actually expect that he's maybe on a short list if something were to happen to President Biden, that he could enter the presidential race this year. And even if it's not this year, it could be in 2028. And Jason, I'm sure you're well aware, Governor Gavin Newsom of California is probably also on those short lists. So I think a lot of political pundits would say that's a subtle dig at a potential future primary opponent. I mean, most uh, governors don't have fan accounts like Socialists for Pritzker or Nomadic Warriors for Pritzker. Maybe they have them for Newsom. I am not aware of them, but yes, Pritzker Uh, does. in, In like the last minute or so, one of the things I noticed too was that he wants to reduce medical debt. Um, Why do you think he's putting that forward? Because it seems like that is going to be some sort of collaboration with the city of Chicago and maybe some nonprofit groups. It's a 
pretty progressive policy proposal, but in Illinois, um, the legislature favors or at least entertains the idea of progressive policy ideas. So if he, if he does want to move on to higher office, if he can have a list of accomplishments of a bunch of progressive policy ideas, that would probably look pretty good for him. And also, not only that, kind of staying on the, the issue of health care, he also was talking really tough against health insurance companies too. And I, I, I heard what he was saying. It's very complex to fit into like 90 seconds. But do you think that that's also the reason he – kind of touched on that issue to burnish his credentials as being uh, against, basically against an unpopular thing like health insurance companies. Yeah, and that'll be one. And he acknowledged that there will be a lot of political backlash to that just because the health insurance industry has a lot of money to throw at it. But that's one that it seemed to have some bipartisan reception, right? If you can limit medical insurance, that's something uh, – or, or save your constituents money. That's something that probably both – Republicans and Democrats in the Illinois legislature can get behind. And I think the only thing that may have had more bipartisan appeal was getting rid of the grocery tax in Illinois. Received a standing ovation standing from ovation. everyone. And, and I, you know, it, even Republicans, I think, are okay with that, although they probably would want to see more taxes cut in Illinois than just that. Is that fair to say? Yes. They would tell you that the grocery tax or elimination of the grocery tax is long overdue and it's just a drop in the bucket. Will Bauer is St. Louis Public Radio's Metro East reporter. Will, thank you for talking with me. Thanks, Jason. Coming up, we'll talk with Illinois State Senator Jill Tracy of Quincy about her reaction to Pritzker's address. This is the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. Welcome back. I'm Jason Rosenbaum. While Illinois Democrats cheered much of Governor Pritzker's proposals, the state's Republican legislators had a more skeptical reaction. Some contend the state's financial future is not as rosy as the governor suggests and are taking issues with some of his priorities. Joining both Will Bauer and myself to discuss the governor's speech is State Senator Jill Tracy. Tracy is a Quincy Republican who represents the state's 50th Senate District, which includes portions of the Metro East. She is also the Republican Caucus Whip. Senator Tracy, welcome to the Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be with you and appreciate the opportunity to spread uh, the message about this budget. What was your general impression of the governor's speech? I've heard many budget speeches over the years, and this was the most disappointing one I've ever heard. I always like to walk away as the minority party finding optimism and something positive from the speeches I've heard in the past years. And uh, the one positive or several positives I I heard were uh, due to our steady influence, the education increase that was promised when we did evidence-based funding reform was in this year. Likewise, uh, the full pension payment that we need to make was in the budget, things that we've advocated all along. We have also advocated for an elimination of the grocery tax, which Illinois has and many neighboring states do not. And the governor mentioned that he was for an elimination of this tax. It's, It's a something that the Republicans have talked about over and over in the last few years as inflation has caused uh, food prices to rise dramatically and they're at an all-time 30-year high right now. So this is a good thing. And uh, we have the Republican bill to get it done because we filed it several years. Senator Don DeWitt has the bill. I'm a co-sponsor of it. And uh, that, those are the highlights. But most disappointingly was the lack of any mention of tax relief. This is the largest budget in Illinois history, $53 billion. He's growing it by $1 billion from last year. And it's it's virtually a tax on all the Illinois taxpayers of $1 billion in various forms. And that's unacceptable to me. We need property tax relief. We need relief from sales tax on gasoline. We need uh, pharmaceutical tax relief. All these things are hurting the working families of Illinois, and they weren't even mentioned in this budget. Instead, the highlight of this governor's priorities 
was to put more money into servicing the undocumented migrants that have come to this state at the governor and the city of Chicago's invitation. Uh, and he's asking all of us to bear the brunt of the cost. Yeah, let's talk about uh, what the governor said about the, the migrant crisis. Uh, he, he made the point that Illinois leaders have a responsibility to make sure people coming to the state from other countries aren't put in deplorable or dangerous conditions. It, it seems that adhering to that goal will require money from somewhere. Is Governor Pritzker correct in trying to treat migrants in a humane manner? Well, I mean, certainly I agree with that, that notion that, yes, we have a humane responsibility, but look at this. They've invited them. They, they uh, declaring ourselves a sanctuary state, that we uh, have the Trust Act in place. This, why wouldn't you come to Illinois when you get free health care? It's been a magnet for people to come to this state. So it's a crisis of his own making. And the policies that the Democrats have put in place have just bolstered it. So yes, they're here. What do you do? Um, I sus suspect he needs to find a good, better plan than putting it on the backs of the taxpayers to do. And let's do the math. If there's 40,000 migrants that have come since last summer, and he's spending a billion dollars on them. There is something wrong with that um, math. It's it just an exorbitant amount to spend on this. And Senator Tracy, what would you maybe suggest that Republicans uh, do to handle this situation, to practically deal with the migrant crisis in Illinois? Well, I mean, I, certainly if, uh, the thing that needs to be done that our state legislators don't have the power, but our federal authorities do, our president has the authority to close the border. I think close the border right now, have a better federal vetting proce process in place. We are not even sure if these people uh, meet the requirements of an asylum seeker. Uh, that's a strict requirement. and. This this has not been vetted, and so yes, we need to demand that the federal authorities and our president handle this. And I believe Pritzker, uh, our governor, has asked for that. He needs to demand it, and he's been in D.C. quite a bit. He's been uh, all over the country stumping for the president. I think the two of them better get together and figure it out. I think they're the ones that have the power to do that. He also mentioned, though, that the Republican congressional delegation from Illinois has opposed the bipartisan Senate immigration deal, which was basically saying that Republicans want to talk about this problem from a federal standpoint, but don't actually want to do anything because they fear that it will hurt Donald Trump's reelection efforts. What did you make of you that know, part of the speech? You know, it was interesting how he wants to put the blame on everybody else for the crisis he's created. But nevertheless, the first step that I think all Republicans across the country want to see first is close the border, stop this incoming. You know, he wanted to blame Governor Abbott. Governor Abbott's got a bigger problem with the crisis than we do. And, and you know, when he was tapped to the max, he had to start sending these migrants to neighboring states. So um, he put the blame where it belongs, accept responsibility for the parts we have created. And like I say, that to me begins with the governor. And Senator Tracy, maybe um, from what I gather, Republican leadership probably had a bigger seat at the table prior to this budget address than maybe y'all have had previously. But of course, you're well aware Republicans are in the super minority in both in both the House and the Senate. Uh, and Democrats can pass a budget without Republican support. Are you hopeful that you can actually negotiate on this budget throughout the session? I am. We did last year. We did. The, the Senate Republicans were at the table, and they took some of our ideas. I mean, we have some very bright budgeteers, uh, Senator DeWitt being a former mayor, and Senator Rose with years of experience um, working uh, as staff and as an attorney and uh, as a longtime legislator in the House and Senate. He is very knowledgeable about this budget process. And we do offer some significant ideas. And in the end, they get adopted. And we're grateful for that. And we're going to keep bringing those ideas forward. Like I say, the grocery tax elimination was our idea. So is a pharmaceutical uh, 
tax elimination, sales tax on gasoline. You know, everybody goes to Missouri to get gas because we have two taxes. We have the federal tax that Missouri and Illinois both have, and we have a sales tax that goes to GRF. And uh, gas prices are pretty high. So there's very many ideas that Republicans have put forward that help working families. That's our priority. And I, I'm just sad that the governor didn't make it his priority and instead is um, spending $1 billion on the crisis. And as I said, if you do the math, that's a lot of money to be spent per capita. Your Senate district includes Quincy up in your neck of the woods to, to Jacksonville, to areas all the way um, south here in the Metro East in Alton and Edwardsville area. Uh, I'm curious, Senator Tracy, what are maybe one or two top issues for you and your constituents this legislative session and then the budget process too? Since being in the legislature since 2006, my priorities have been economic development, putting policies in place that encourage economic growth, and that brings forth natural, rever grow, re, natural revenue growth to the coffers of the state, and also infrastructure. Infrastructure is of the utmost importance to economic growth and public safety, and uh, we sit right across the river from Missouri and Iowa and uh, Kentucky and Indiana and Wisconsin, and we see people fleeing our state for, and most importantly, job creators, the, the businesses that go over to these states because of our uh, egregious business policies. Uh, do, you have a specific, do you have a specific, like, egregious business policy that you'd like to oh, highlight? Our workman, sure. Our workman's compensation uh, presumes that the employee is right and the employer is wrong. That's not the, the way it works in uh Missouri, the employer there has a fighting chance to prove that the causation wasn't due to the job factors, but created off-site. So our, our corporate tax policies, um, you know, I, there's many. Our unemployment insurance structure uh, to do, um, to start up a business, uh, the you don't get a break um, for not having any claims. You have, you're thrown into a pool of all employers and um, given a rate that's based when you don't even have any unemployment insurance claims. So yeah, we have many policies that uh, could, could use some reform that would invite more businesses. And if you look, um, we've uh, sometimes had to be creative to try to hang on to our major businesses like Caterpillar and uh, State Farm and, and say, you know, we value you, we need you. Um, but if you talk with them, they'll say, yeah, it's, it's tough doing business in the state of Illinois. Before we let you go, the, the final question I have that, that comes to mind is that uh, Pritzker noted that Illinois isn't having some of the same budgetary problems as other blue states like California. And from the outside looking in, it seems that's the case because he's paired a lot of his uh, programmatic desires with tax increases that could pay for these things in the long term. Isn't that a more responsible way of governing a state, given that Illinois can't print money and can't, you know, do what the federal government does? Well, I thought it was interesting that he wanted to disregard California uh, when, in fact, we keep trying to pass bills that are based on many of the ideas that California has done, which has uh, caused a lot of their economic woes and, and businesses leaving that state. But we had a significant amount of federal money, and instead of using it to better use, in my opinion, the governor created more programs and more spending. Uh, you just look at this health care for migrants and undocumented. Right now, uh, they've put a hold on the program, but there was quite a few people that came here wanting to be on that program, and they didn't even have co-pays. It was, it was a health insurance policy better than any resident of Illinois without co-pays, uh, just without any limits whatsoever. And it's, it's an absorbent amount of cost to our system. And in the end, it is, hits the Illinois taxpayer because if we go above the federal Medicaid uh, restrictions, it's all on Illinois to make that difference up. And when I say all of Illinois, it's the Illinois taxpayers. Senator Jill Tracy is a Republican from Quincy and represents Illinois' 50th district. She joined us from her office in the state capitol in Springfield. Senator Tracy, thanks for joining Will Bauer and me today. 
Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you highlighting Illinois. The Politically Speaking Hour on St. Louis on the Air is produced by Jason Rosenbaum, Alex Hoyer, Emily Woodbury, Danny Wisentowski, Maya Norfleet, and Elaine Cha. Audio engineering and sound design by Aaron Dorr. The politics editor is Fred Ehrlich, and our production intern is Roche Hemmings. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis.